Welcome back, mineralogy fans. The surface of Venus is a hellish 460 degrees Celsius, and this is not due to being closer to the Sun. It's due to having most of the planet's carbon released into the Venusian atmosphere, acting as heat-trapping greenhouse gases. Fortunately for the Earth, most of our carbon is locked up in carbonate minerals. In our list of the 15 most abundant elements in the Earth's crust, the most abundant element by far is oxygen. And at the bottom of the list is 15th most common, carbon. Put them together and they form the CO3-2 complex anion, a triangular molecule with oxygens at the corners and a carbon at the center. This complex anion and a plus 2 cation will neutralize and crystallize our carbonate minerals. Depending on the bonding cations and their crystal geometry, we can distinguish four main groups. The calcite group, the aragonite group, the dolomite group, and then the group with the extra hydroxyl anion. The most common bonding cation in carbonates is calcium, making the chemical formula CaCO3, calcium carbonate, which in one geometry is calcite, and in another is aragonite. We start with my favorite mineral, calcite, as this is the mineral that makes up most formations in solution caves, the stalagmites, stalactites, and flowstones that we see underground, and is a mineral that makes up the skeletons of corals and plankton. Calcite makes up sedimentary rock limestone and the metamorphic rock marble, and so the physical properties of calcite also determine the physical properties of those rocks. Lime is another term for this material, hence the rock limestone. Lime means to bind together, and comes from limestone being used as the base for cements. The Latin for lime is calc, or calx. So limestone is a calcite stone. The mineral calcite has a non-metallic vitreous to pearly luster and a relatively soft hardness of 3 on the Mohs scale, meaning your fingernail doesn't scratch it, but a penny, paperclip, knife, or fluorite will. Calcite has three directions of cleavage, which are off of 90 degrees to give it a blocky, rhombic shape, which is often one of the first things to clue us off to calcite's identity. The color of calcite can vary widely, as in quartz. The streak is an all-too-common white, and the specific gravity of near 2.7 is not very diagnostic either. But all calcite varieties react with even weak acids, such as vinegar, though we use 10 molar diluted HCl, hydrochloric acid, to consistently test for this property we call effervescence. Because calcite makes up the sedimentary rock limestone or the metamorphic rock marble, both of these will also effervesce in hydrochloric acid. In fact, all carbonates will effervesce with HCl, but some will do so better than others, which is why we use a consistent 10 molar concentration of HCl to determine relative vigor of the reaction. Calcite is the most common mineral that shows this property really well, though. Often the edges of calcite crystals display rainbow colors called birefringence, because calcium has an interesting property known as double refraction. The birefringent rainbows are due to the separation and interference of wavelengths of light across a thin plate of the crystal face. The effect is even more drastic with very transparent large crystals of calcite. As we turn a calcite crystal, we see it splits light rays into one beam that does not shift, called the ordinary ray, and another beam that rotates around the other image, called the extraordinary ray. When a piece of clear calcite from Iceland made it to England in the 17th century, this property was used to disprove Newton's particulate theory of light, and even the going wave theory of light, and it was not until Thomas Young came up with a new wave theory that this property could be explained, and students of physics will know that Young's wave theory is a basis of quantum mechanics, so the double refraction of calcite is evidence of a very deep and mysterious property of nature. My dear calcite, as limestone and marble has been used as a building material for millennia, as demonstrated by the limestone pyramids of Egypt and the Capitol building of Washington. And more recently, we learned to turn these calcite-based rocks into cement. Calcite is ground up to be used as an antacid, both in the environment and in our stomachs. Calcite binds with sulfur compounds really well to act as a scrubber on smokestacks to prevent sulfuric acid rain. 
When powdered, calcite is generally white, as we see in its streak, and is thus the base pigment of whitewash and a lightening agent for paints in general. It is a soft scrubbing agent as a hardness of three will take off food particles while remaining unable to scratch common household surfaces. Powdered calcite is also used in coal mines as safety dust, sprayed on the walls to lower coal dust and help make the walls more reflective for illumination. It is easily carved into monuments and statuary, which extends my ability to say the beauty and usefulness of calcite are undeniable. And its ability to fix carbon keeps us from frying, like Venus. Makes me want to go back into my precious cool caves. Now, in my exploration of deep and mysterious caves, most formations are made of calcite. But some of the formations I come across are CaCO3, but not calcite. Instead, these formations are made of a more fibrous mineral, aragonite, which is what we call a polymorph of calcite, the same CaCO3 formula, but different crystal structure. With most of these carbonates being microcrystalline, it is necessary to do optical tests to tell which you have in a sample. In larger crystals, the properties and uses of aragonite are basically the same as calcite, with the exception of the crystal habit, and cleavage, and another difference is that mother-of-pearl, oyster shells, and pearls are definitely aragonite. Either way, don't put your pearls in vinegar. Now, magnesium is very similar to calcium in size and charge, so we can swap it into the CaCO3 formula to make a solid solution from pure CaCO3 to pure MgCO3, which is the relatively rare magnesite. The solid solution between calcite and magnesite, with various levels of calcium and magnesium in between, is generally called dolomite. Dolomite is much like calcite, with similar rhombic three directions of cleavage around 3 to 4 hardness and will effervesce in hydrochloric acid, but the more magnesium there is in the dolomite, the less vigorously it will effervesce. By making dolomite into a powder, the increased surface area will allow one to observe even weak effervescence better. Magnesite must be powdered to really see the reaction. Being similar to calcite, dolomite can have a variety of colors, though brown to gray is the most common. With calcite, aragonite, and dolomite as the most common of their forms, each names the group of similar crystals. In the calcite group, we have the most common calcite, and some less common minerals such as our previously encountered magnesite, the iron carbonate siderite, the manganese carbonate rhodochrosite, which is the state mineral of Colorado, the cobalt carbonate, spherocobalite, and the peculiarly beautiful zinc carbonate smithsonite, whose vitreous to pearly luster can display a wonderful variety of colors and brilliant reflections. In the aragonite group, the less common varieties include the lead carbonate, cerusite, the strontium carbonate, strontianite, or the barium carbonate, witherite. In the dolomite group, we also see the calcium iron carbonate, anchorite, or the magnesium over calcium rich, huntite, most of these minerals can react with water to form hydrated carbonates with water incorporated into the formula, but these are relatively rare. The last group are the carbonates with a hydroxyl complex anion. The most notable carbonates in this group are the deep blue azurite and the deep green malachite, both of which are copper carbonates with hydroxyl attached. These are definitely more rare than calcite, dolomite, or aragonite, but they really catch our attention. There are other rare carbonate forms, but I just want to mention this one last carbonate mineral, hanksite. We often say in this series that nature does not like to be pigeonholed, and hanksite's formula shows us that it could be considered a carbonate, or it could be considered a sulfate mineral. This is just one example of many minerals that do not fit comfortably into our bins, but the seven mineral groups is still a useful organizational concept, and so we look forward to our next episode, the oxide minerals.